is Ali Yates, and my project is called When Bacteria Get Good, Progress, Purity, and the Making of Probiotics. The Human Microbiome Project is a United States National Institute of Health initiative that is set to be completed in 2013. It works to map out the microscopic environments, the microflora of the human body, through genetic and microbiological analysis. The project recently discovered that the amount of microbial and bacterial cells found in the human body so the cells of so-called non-human organisms actually outnumber the amount of human cells known to make up our bodies by an approximate ratio of 10 to 1. There are major scientific and philosophical consequences of these findings. The idea that a human body, that our very skin and insides, are separate and isolated from the environment around us is beginning to collapse. Our bodies are more non-human than human. My research project focuses on one aspect of this new dynamic body, the microorganisms that are said to nourish the complex ecosystems inside of us. These microorganisms are called probiotics. My research question asks how probiotics and the narratives about them are imagined, discovered, and disseminated. Who is involved in the social and scientific politics of probiotics from the moment they are isolated in the laboratory to the day they appear on a shelf? My research involves three sections. One, scientific research on probiotics. Two, government regulation of probiotics. And three, the marketing of probiotics containing yogurt and supplements. My methodology involved participant observation at a multidisciplinary probiotics conference in New York City, where I examined the tensions between scientific research, public policy, and corporate interests involving probiotics. I'm 
was commented on by the medical director of Scotland, who said to the assembly, all we need is a narrative that goes with the grain of modern life. Although the notion of using fermented foods with good bacteria, i.e. probiotics, has actually been used in medicinal systems across the world for many centuries, this conference maintained a heavy emphasis on probiotics as a modern technology. This has particularly socio-political effects when modern technologies are called upon as solutions for a less modern, developing world. Scholars and activists in post-colonial studies and STS argue that descriptions of modernity have the consequence, often an unintended one, of creating juxtaposition. If some are modern, others are pre-modern. The concept of a modern is often employed as a means to romanticize those who are rendered pre-modern. For example, Lactobacillus reuteri is a strain of probiotics that, according to BioGaia, its global distributor, was, quote, isolated from the breast milk of a woman living in the Peruvian Andes, someone living in perfect harmony with nature, end quote. <laughs> the notion that the bodily resource of a more natural, less modern woman can work to nourish the system of a less natural, more modern, Western-centered consumer works to maintain troubling and colonial hierarchies of power. When such a dichotomy, one of modern versus pre-modern, is established, one actor is coded as superior and has certain moral responsibilities to help the other. This brings me to another narrative that was quite persistent throughout the conference. And I just want to ask, should I just keep going in terms of time? Yes. Because yeah. they said five minutes, but okay. The idea that probiotics are not simply helpful for the human body, but that using probiotics is morally correct is my second theme. One keynote lecturer at the event was quite straightforward. He said, probiotics are morally correct. We are all here for the betterment of our fellow human beings, end quote. A large part of this message of moral high ground is related to one of the current uses of probiotics. Certain probiotic strains have been found to prevent and treat some gut and urogenital condi conditions, which are chronic and rampant in highly impoverished regions of sub-Saharan Africa. The relative low cost and practical means by which probiotics can be consumed that is in a bowl of yogurt, makes probiotics a feasible form of aid for the aforementioned conditions. However, the actual provisioning of probiotics in these areas has not really successfully taken place. One visiting science in the audience attempted to explain why probiotics are not being well integrated in sub-Saharan Africa. He said, quote, these people, ignorant in a way because of their own beliefs, sadly reject our life-saving assistance, end quote. Chandra Mohanty, a third, wave, a third world feminist, argues against the reductionist and dichotomous language used to describe individuals in the so-called third world. She critiques, for example, the quote, production of the third world woman as a singular monolithic subject, end quote. In such a representation, quote, third world women are portrayed as ignorant, poor, uneducated, tradition bound, victimized, etc., end quote while Western scientists are quoted as intelligent, stable, progressive, and in this case, morally obligated to transmit a life-saving knowledge, <coughs> the products of Western science, even to those who may not want it. Probiotics products involve a very different market in the so-called first world. Target customers in Europe and the US are particularly focused on their own personal, individual health routine. I found that this notion of individuality was central to the discussions of the human microbiome as well as the discussions about probiotics marketing that I witnessed at the conference. As scientists discuss the future of microbiome data, they explain that at some point in the near future, lay people in the West will have access to detailed, personalized information about their own microbiomes. They'll know what kind of good bacteria are growing in them, how to and how to maintain this environment by taking specially crafted probiotics. Scientists, this marketing panel explained, as well as members of the pharmaceutical chemical industry, need to start developing platforms for individualized products right now. These types of products depend on notions of the autonomous individual. That it is an individual's responsibility to maintain and regulate their own bodies. Such a concept of individual consumerism and responsibility is inextricably tied to neoliberalism, a set of free market economic policies that have become widespread during the last 25 years or so in the US. Each person this policy asserts is in charge of their own well-being. Moreover, it is much more profitable to make personalized industries, as the microbiome is entailing. 
some people will always be able to pay a dramatically higher price for services. We see examples of this everywhere, from the car one drives to the health insurance one is able to afford. Focusing on the excitement of individualized possibilities, the conference did not spend time discussing those who might not be able to afford such personalized data and products. So to summarize my findings, the microbiome and probiotics explicitly involve dedicated Western scientists and global partners. But studies rarely mention the other persons involved in the knowledge formation process, such as an anonymous MDN woman and her capitalizable friend film. They do not make calls for changes in social, political, or economic systems that compromise lives on a daily basis. They do not trouble what it means for individualized products to specially cater to some, but not to all. In this talk, I argue that political and personal nuances are rendered invisible, when all we have is a summary of conference proceedings, a published account of a clinical trial, and a label on a box in a grocery store. Earlier, I discussed Briggs's notion of biocommunicability, which involves three basic, normative modes of storytelling. Within probiotic science, probiotics become biocommunicable. Simple, straightforward stories about them travel through researchers eventually to consumers. Issues of race, nationalism, and class are not a part of these stories. But is this really a pressing issue? As I mentioned earlier, probiotics in the US and Europe appeal to a very niche market, so overly simple stories are really only being transmitted to a few communities. However, with the expansion of probiotics industry through the Human Microbiome Project, these troublingly simple biocommunicable probiotic stories will go global. To employ Briggs' own words, spatialities, temporalities, subject positions get naturalized, end quote, unless we pay careful attention to them as they're being made. Therefore, I argue for a close analysis of what STS scholars call science and making. When we look at scientific research before it has become widely accepted, unquestionable knowledge, we get to see something in the making. We get to become more in tune to a more complex picture of the world. And we can allow for interventions in order to deeply trouble biocommunicable notions. I present my argument that probiotics are socially and politically produced, not so that we'll lose hope in the human microbiome project or in probiotic science at large. Rather, I want to find a way to embrace these profoundly exciting findings in scientific research without losing hold of notions of social justice. As the human microbiome expands the very boundaries of what it means to be human, we cannot lose sight of or cease to trouble the subjectivities and systems to which we are very much still bound today. I want to thank SERP, LNS, Leah Carroll, my mentor, Corey Hayden, Timo Rodriguez, the New York Academy of Sciences, my friends and family, and the genus Dr. Vassilis for being so much more than good bacteria. <laughs>